Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. The Lord our God is great. The Lord is worthy of our praise. Come, let us remember the great things God has done for us. Let us not neglect to teach our children the greatness of God. Let us not forget our past and those who have gone before us. Remember our ancestors, our history, our relationship with our African-American brothers and sisters, and we name our future. Let us lift up our voices in song, lift our arms in praise, and open our hearts in gratitude. Let us greet God with our hymn of praise. This morning's hymn of praise is number 530 in the Chalice Hymnal, I've Got Peace Like a River. All those who are able, please rise. You may be seated. Our unison prayer of invocation comes from the Black Catholic Ministry and Diocese of Baltimore. We pray, O Lord, for change. Jesus, you revealed God through your wise words and loving deeds, and we encounter you still today in the faces of those whom society has pushed to the margins. Guide us through the love you revealed to establish the justice you proclaimed that all peoples might dwell in harmony and peace, united by that one love that binds us to each other and to you. And most of all, Lord, change our routine worship and work into us a genuine encounter with you and our better selves so that our lives will be changed from the good of all. Let us pray. Great creator of us all, our Father in heaven, who embraces us today like a mother, we gather to give you thanks for the beauty of this day, for the green trees and the blue skies for each breath <clears throat> for life itself and for the joy and privilege of knowing and worshiping you. We give you thanks for our graduates and those who have worked so hard in school to be honored this day. We thank you for our fathers who are committed to loving and being there for their children. 
and their commitment to you. We thank you for the celebration of Juneteenth Day, a day we learn from our African American brothers and sisters who have celebrated this day for over a century and for what they have taught us. Once again, we realize that we have so much to learn. We gather today in the full knowledge of our shortcomings. Our lives set before us many tasks and often we are not equal to them. We fall short of our own expectations. We find we do not know enough. We're not always patient. We fall into anger and we can't find the strength. We lack the vision. We wait in vain for wisdom. And we find it very painful to acknowledge our shortcomings. Yet we are here. And being here, we dedicate this small amount of time together to you and to our own renewal. May the words we hear this morning give us courage. May the songs we sing give us hope. May your spirit be like fresh spring water to our parched spirits, giving us the energy to continue the journey. And most of all, may the touch of hands, the sight of, the sight of faces, and the sound of voices lifted in song and affirmations restore in our faith that this world may be made whole, that your kingdom might come and your will might be done on earth here as in heaven for all people. We pray this in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. How do we dream and not just fantasize about a world that looks like the one God intended? How do we make the words we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, more than mere words? One way is to make a sacrifice, believing that not only our acts of service, but our gifts help First Congregational Church to be salt and light in our world. Won't you give so that we can continue to make a difference? This morning's offering will now be received. Good morning, everyone. Uh, most of you know that I was active in the civil rights movement uh, in the 60s. Uh, Martin came through uh, Wichita, Kansas in the summer of 63, and we all ran out to meet him and say hello to him at the local train station. And uh, then I had an opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. And I sat on, on a bus ride that I thought would never end from Washington, D.C., or from Wichita, Kansas, to Washington, D.C. And we were there in the summer of uh, 1963 when Martin gave his famous speech seated on the Lincoln Memorial. And uh, before, uh, the luncheon before, he had had his other speech, which was the I Have a Dream speech. And Mahalia Jackson, the great gospel singer, was on stage uh, up with uh, Martin, Medgar Evers, and some of the others, and uh, Martin was getting ready to read his speech, and Mahalia leaned forward, uh, not a woman to be ignored, and she said, Martin, tell him about the dream. And that's where the I Have a Dream speech did. So he stuck his original speech in and talked off the top, and that was the great speech that we all uh, heard him deliver, uh, the dream of a uh, of a, of a world where 
the white children, black children, Asians, American Indians, all would share uh, life together in a world free of prejudice. And it was a real important moment in my life. I was 19 years old that year, <laughs> so we know that was a really long time ago. And it was hotter than blazes in Washington, D.C. And uh, I learned then that Martin's favorite song, his favorite hymn was Precious Lord Take My Hand. So we remember one of the great, great Americans, Martin Luther King, with his favorite song, Precious Lord Take My Hand. Gracious God, we let go of something that is valuable to us in order that we might do something more valuable for you. We let go, trusting that you are at work here and that you have given us a mission to fulfill. Bless these gifts as you bless the loaves and fish that they may multiply and be used to bless the world. Amen. Our hymn is number 615, I Shall Not Be Moved.
see. At this time, I would like to recognize all the members of our church who have graduated this year. Emma Dobrovich, Westover School. Michael Langston, Stratford High School. Kirsten Nyquist, Trumbull High School. Kendall Smith, Stratford High School. Ryan Cardamus, the Police Academy. Dr. Helen Langston, Northeastern University. Jonathan Larson, UConn, and Nathaniel Larson, UConn. Before I award the scholarship, I would like to recognize the scholarship committee. Bill Haberlin, Jennifer Nyquist, Lynn Pert, Deb Perman, and Eric Nyquist. I would like to note this year, due to a conflict of interest, a number of the committee members recluse themselves from the church scholarship selection process. On behalf of the scholarship committee, I would like to award the scholarships to our graduating high school seniors. The criteria for judging these scholarships is scholarship, scholastic achievement, church and community activity involvement, leadership qualities, and achievement potential. The Francis C. and Harriet B. Blakeman Memorial Scholarship is given by the Board of Trustees in recognition of the Blakeman's devotion and generosity to First Congregational Church. This year's recipient is an honor graduate of Trumbull High School. Graduating with a 5.1 GPA and in the top 2% of her graduating class, taking a course load of mostly honors and advanced placement courses attest to her outstanding academic achievement. She is a National Merit Commended student and a member of the National Honor Society, as well as the English, Math, Science, Spanish, and Social Studies National Honor Societies. She was selected by her high school administration and teachers to be Trumbull High School's ambassador to the Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership Seminar. A member of numerous clubs at Trumbull High, she also volunteered at Nourish Bridgeport, Allies for Angels, Friends of Appalachia, and was part of a student focus group on diversity, equity, and inclusion. But perhaps the biggest commitment of her time and talent has been as a USGA competitive gymnast. Having achieved the highest level, level 10, she would train five to six days a week for at least four hours per day at the Connecticut Gymnastic Academy in Wallingford, which is also an hour and a half commute. She has won multiple state championships and is a four-time regional ball around champion. She was baptized, attended Sunday school, sang in the youth choir, and was confirmed here at First Congregational Church. She has also been involved with the youth advisory and regularly attends Sunday worship. She has chosen to attend the University of Virginia to major in chemistry on a pre-med track with the goal of becoming an orthopedic surgeon. A lovely person inside and out, she is hardworking, intelligent, empathetic, and focused on her future. I am pleased and honored to award the Francis C. and Harriet B. Blakeman Memorial Scholarship of $2,000 to Kirsten Nyquist. The Joel and Mary Vidola Sacred Music Scholarship is funded by a grant from the Reverend Esther Vidola. It is limited to a student majoring in music or education. This year's recipient is an honor graduate of the Westover School in Middlebury, Connecticut, having taken a challenging program of honors and advanced placement courses. She served on many boards and clubs at Westover. Most notably, she was elected as a, as a first head of the West student leader and was elected as a Senate representative. 
She was actively involved in Invest in Girls, Theme Year Committee, and the Starling Newsletter. She was also involved in Westover Community Service Day and served as a student ambassador. She was recently awarded the Ager Award and the Mulder Scholarship Award. With a passion for the arts, she has been a dancer at Studio 54 for the past 14 years and was a teaching assistant for their Tiny Tots program. She was dance captain for the dance ensemble at Westover and took part in the handbell ensemble for four years. Here at First Congregational Church, she was baptized, attended Sunday school, sang in the youth choir, and was confirmed. This fall, she will attend Bard College to pursue her degree in English and education. Without question, this hardworking, energetic, talented young woman has an amazing future ahead of her. I am pleased and honored to award the Joel and Mary Vidola Scholarship of $2,000 to Emma Dobrovich. John Miller Edward Zorn Scholarship and the Jim Ella Seebeck Scholarship. This year's recipient is an honor graduate of Stratford High School. A talented student athlete, he played both football and basketball at Stratford High, as well as playing AAU basketball. He served as a new student ambassador, helping new students acclimate to their high school setting. His kind heart and sense of community service has led him to volunteer for many worthwhile causes in Stratford and the surrounding towns. He has volunteered in the after school program at Sterling House, helping kids with their homework and keeping them entertained until it was time for them to leave. He has participated in handing out food and warm clothing to the homeless and helping with food drives. He has also served as a coach assistant for the Waller basketball camp. At First Congregational Church, he was baptized, attended Sunday school, and was confirmed. He has participated in the Lenten suppers and has been an active participant in the PF youth group, serving his church and community and attending Silver Lake retreats. He is actively involved in the church's racial justice team. <clears throat> He is headed for Norfolk State University in Virginia in the fall to study business. A polite, responsible, personable, and compassionate individual, he is destined to achieve his goals in life. I am pleased and honored to award the John Miller Edward Zorn Memorial Scholarship of $500 and the Jim and Ella Seebeck Memorial Scholarship of $250 to Michael Langston. Our final scholarship is the Edna Viner Memorial Scholarship and is given to a graduate student pursuing an advanced degree. This year's scholarship recipient is a very familiar face in our church community. He has been a lifelong member of the church, having been baptized, attended Sunday school, and was confirmed here. He presently plays an integral part in the Christian Ed program serving as a Sunday school teacher and graces us often with his talented singing voice. A member of the racial justice team, he is also a past recipient of the Blakeman Scholarship. He is a graduate of Fairfield Prep and received his bachelor degree from Fairfield U with a major in classical studies and a minor in education. The education interest came during his junior year of college and helped solidify his desire to become an educator. Upon graduation, he landed a teaching job at Elm City Montessori School in New Haven, <coughs> excuse me, and the experience changed his life. He's passionate about the Montessori teaching method, 
and looks forward to leading his own classroom where he hopes to bring openness and diversity sensitivity to his students so they can be successful citizens and human beings. This fall, he will be attending the University of Hartford to pursue his master's degree in Montessori education. Having seen his impact on our Sunday school students, we know he will be very successful in his chosen career. The Edna Viner Memorial Scholarship of $2,000 is awarded to Jordan Bacon. Will you all join me, please, in the prayer for ourselves and our children? It's written in the bulletin. Loving God, bless us that we may be a blessing to our children. Help us remember who we are and from where we have come. Help us remember the things you have done for us in the past so we can teach them to our children. May we give them hope and enthusiasm for the future. May we give them openness to your holy message of forgiveness, grace, and love. May they, too, want to walk in the paths of righteousness. May your word live in them for generations to come. Hear this prayer we offer today. Amen. Congratulations to all our scholarship winners. Please turn your Bibles to page 674. <sighs> Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet the day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interests on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with wicked fists. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. And such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself is it to bow down their head like a bulrush, and to lie in slack cloth and ashes. Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds in injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor to your house? When you see the naked, cover them and not hide yourself from your own kin. Then your light shall break forth like dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your regard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, 
the speaking of evil. If you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in darkness and your gloom be like the non-day, the noon day. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose water never fails amen Good morning, everyone, and congratulations again to all the graduates and their parents and educators that got them here. Uh, my name is Tammy Langston, and for those of you who don't know me, I am the Director of Youth and Social Justice here at First Congregational Church of Stratford. We're celebrating a couple of things today. To all the men, especially my husband, happy Father's Day. And to all of you who have guided and loved our children, we appreciate you more than you'll ever know. And happy Juneteenth Day, especially to my black brothers and sisters. We celebrate Juneteenth because it symbolizes freedom and justice for African Americans. President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, declaring that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are and henceforth shall be free. However, it wasn't until 900 days later on June 19, 1865, that enslaved humans in Texas were told of the proclamation. So why specify Texas? This brings me to my next point. What can we as white people do on Juneteenth? We can reflect on the bondage of humans and chattel slavery that persisted for centuries, learn the true history of Juneteenth, and educate ourselves on the institutional and systemic racism that was embedded in our country and our churches that continues to this day. I encourage you to learn about the importance of the American holiday Juneteenth and to become an ally of African Americans if you are not already. We've invited our guest, Mr. Jeffrey Fletcher, to join us today to talk about the Ruby and Calvin Fletcher African American Museum right here in Stratford across the street from this church. As stated on their website, Mr. Fletcher is a lifelong Connecticut resident who has, was raised in southeastern Connecticut, one of four children whose parents migrated from the South during the Jim Crow and turbulent civil rights movements. After graduating from high school and college, he began what he refers to as one of the many inspirational points in his life that brought him to collecting African American artifacts and memorabilia. The exhibit is a collection of artifacts that reflects decades of turbulent times for African Americans in these United States during the period of slavery and the civil rights movements. It brings visitors up close and personal, which is an experience that many have only read about in history books or seen in movies. The exhibit embraces the teachings of tolerance, diversity, unity, and educating people that there was a time when imagery played a significant role in how African Americans were perceived. The artifacts and memorabilia may seem to be difficult to view, but they are a part of African American history that needs to be told just as much as the triumphs which made African American pioneers and trailblazers. The exhibit is an opportunity to begin honest conversations regarding a rich and strong history which has historically been maligned. The Images of America exhibit is an experience which will leave lasting impressions and memories. After worship, we invite you to walk or drive across the street for a personal tour of the museum. And I hope you'll all join us. And now please welcome Mr. Jeffrey Fletcher. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can everyone hear me? Okay, thank you. I want to thank Reverend Rawls. 
um, Ms. Langston, and I want to thank the congregation for being here today with me. Uh, yes, uh, like Ms. Langston had mentioned, this has been a journey. It's been a journey that I, I can't explain, but it takes on, and I like to move around. As I spoke with Reverend Rawls earlier and Ms. Langston in the week, I, I'm not one to stand up on a podium and I don't like to lecture at people. So uh, it makes me feel comfortable to make sure that everybody understands and that they can uh, enjoy this conversation. And I promise Reverend Rawls that I will minimize and I'm gonna be looking for my cue. <laughs> It's been said that I've been long, I'm very long-winded, but I want to make sure that I'm detailed and I want to make sure that everyone uh, hears me. So, yes, this has been a journey. It's been um, a 12-year, 13-year journey, but I, I need to preface. Um, my history, my careers have been in psychology. I'm a graduate of the University of New Haven, uh, BA Masters in Psychology. I spent 14 years in the, as a journeyman, as I call it, in the Department of Mental Health. So I've, did, I've done kind of like everything, but couldn't find my niche. So at some point I took a year off. My mom was very active in civil rights in southeastern Connecticut. So I can pinpoint this. Colchester, Connecticut, if you all know where that is. It's kind of like the backyard of the University of Connecticut. So out in rural Colchester, southeastern Connecticut, my family was one of eight African American families in that community. The community was inhabited by uh, generations of Jewish immigrants. So there's going to be a tie to this too, right? So I took a year off. My mom was in, involved in civil rights. She was uh, an ardent, diehard fan of Senator Christopher Dodd, who kind of like raised me as well along the East Haddam River up in that way because um, you know, she, she worked for him, she advocated for him, and he could walk on water. So I took a year off in between jobs, and at that point I was at the beginning of starting my life, getting a real life. I met my, my wife, who said at that time, you gotta get a real job. Because I played basketball too, I forgot to tell you that. So I traveled overseas and I was a basketball player, if you kind of like couldn't figure that out. <laughs> and so when I met her, um, she said, you have to get a real job. Um, at that point, I decided to go into law enforcement, which took me down a path of 22 years as a New Haven police officer, detective. And then as I was retiring, thought I was retiring, and I was collecting and so forth artifacts, I ended up being hooked by the United States Marshal Service uh, Protective and Judicial Services, which I stayed for a year. Now, in all of that, that career changing and things, my mom had passed away. She was a child of the Jim Crow uh, South, oppression, seen a lot of Ku Klux Klan. My dad was from, a, my mom was from Camden, South Carolina. My dad was a, from a place called Fuquay, Farina, North Carolina, for all y'all, just outside of Raleigh. But they didn't meet until they came to Colchester where, you know, subsequently they were married and had us. But, my mom, when she was younger, and if you all, when you all come to the museum, and I hope you all do get to get, get there by today, or if not, sometime in your travels uh, in Stratford, you'll see a card with a shack on it, and you'll see it with a tree on it, right? The, tr the shack represents how my mom lived in Camden, South Carolina, with her seven brothers and sisters on a sharecropper's farm, which was owned by white folk. And that was the only way that they can live there because they had to harvest in the, in, the, uh, in the fall and they had to plant in the spring. So the two oldest out of the seven, which was my mom and her brother, were forced, not asked, but forced to have to harvest and plant. And we know during harvest time is what year, time of year? September, correct? And children are in where? Schools, right? But her education was interrupted in the spring, in the spring as well. That was the cycle. So she got tired of having to do that. But mind you, all during her childhood, she would collect brick-brack things, like as we see today, these Uncle Ben, Aunt Jemima, Mammy statues, Mammy, salt and pepper shakers, signage, which we call in the business Yefremra, which is paper signage, uh, signs that go on bathrooms, um, no colors allowed. So she would take her little bit of money that she earned on these sharecropper farms and she would put it together, and when she had an opportunity, she would go purchase these things. Or sometimes people would give her things. 
So as she was collecting as a child, and she was scheming her plan of how she was going to get away from Jim Crow South, at the age of 16, she decided to leave, unbeknownst to my grandfather and my grandmother. And my grandfather was put in county jail for about a week in, in uh, South Carolina because my mom was such a spitfire that she didn't want to work the fields. And so in lieu of that, they put him in county jail until he was able to get control of my mom to make her work. But unbeknownst to him, she had left South Carolina and migrated to the, to the Northeast. Now, all of them, I'm not going to give you this history because it, it, it would be too convoluted, too long for us to be here. But there was a great push for African Americans to leave the South, and it was called the Great Migration to Go North. My mom didn't know anything about the Great Migration to Go North. All she knew about was how do I get away from this oppressive atmosphere, this, this, this heavy uh, segregation, this heavy presence of the Ku Klux Klan. And by the way, if some of us know Billie Holiday back in the 30s, and not all of us will, but some of us do, not even me, she wrote a, a, a song called Strange Fruit. And it had to do with African Americans being hung in, in the South by the Klan. But my mom used to say, when they had students or friends or people from the community missing in the community, you see the blackbird fly. And when you saw the blackbird fly, it means that there's some sort of um, animal or human being that has not, uh, that is dead. So she got tired of looking at that, seeing that image, hearing about friends being missing or people being lynched or in prison. So she decided to leave and she came north to a place called Colchester. Now remember when I talked about Colchester and what Colchester was and the immigrants, Jewish immigrants, she was taken in by a Jewish family at the age of 16. And that family have relatives to this day. I'm connected to, uh, to uh, Colchester. And she wasn't taken in as a servant or a domestic. She was taken in as a human being, a young child, a young lady that they needed to want to nurture and want to help educate about her history and theirs. So my mom was raised in this home um, for the majority of her teenage life up into her adulthood. She was taught about Passover. She was taught about their, their religions and culture. Passovers, Bar Mitzvahs, Bas Mitzvahs, Rosh Hashanah, um, and the high holidays in uh, uh, the Jewish uh, faith. To the extent of when we got older, as we were growing up, we celebrated those holidays as well. So I tell people we had the best, my brothers and sisters had the best of both worlds. We were taught about our Baptist background but we also celebrated the Jewish holidays as well. So um, I tell people I had the best of both worlds and that um, it was just a, a great life um, and uh, know a little bit of Yiddish, uh, spent a lot of time in the synagogue or the temple. My mom spent a de definite lot of time in, in the synagogue and the temple until her passing. When she passed, This collection that she had accumulated for those years from South Carolina to Connecticut because she continued to collect. And they were up to about 200 items. And when she passed, my, my dad called each and one, every one of them, because my brother and sisters live in the Mid-Atlantic states, Maryland, Washington. And I was the only one that stayed up here. So he called us and he said, your mama left some containers for you. So I'm thinking, you know, containers, small containers. But he said, you need to come out and get them because they're everything from what you did in first grade, second grade, third grade. So that includes on Father's Day. By the way, happy Father's Day to all of us in here uh, celebrating this on this day. So that includes Father's Day, Mother's Day. When we were children in the first and second grade, we used to make those hideous handprints in paper or, or uh, uh, the pot holders and the ugly ties and things that we used to give, she kept all of that. And her rationale was, someday, I know when you all have a family, you get out of college, and some of you all that are getting ready to go to college, and congratulations, right? When you go to college and you graduate, you don't become stable right away. I found that out, my brother and sisters found that out. 
we become kind of transient, right? So if we had all that stuff when we left for high school and took with us, we wouldn't have anything to show our children when we got older. So my mom had the presence of mind back then, and we're talking going back to the 70s, right? Because I graduated in 1975, high school. I, I just told you my age, right? And so she collected all this stuff. So when I got to Colchester, my dad called me. My, Is that the cue, Pat? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see something. It might, could be mine, I'll check. If it is, it's my mother telling me to shut up. <laughs> I'm going to find out now. I'm going to be quick. <laughs> I, I, I didn't do that, y'all. I, I did not do that. All right, I'm going to be quick. Okay. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So when, when she passed away, my dad summoned us out there. And we went out there, and I went out there, and I went with my daughter at the time. Uh, I have one child, a daughter, and uh, she was in junior high school. So as I get out there, I walk through the door, because my mom had passed before my dad. And um, I get there, and we walk into the den. I walk in the front door, and then I go to the den. And I see all these Rubbermaid containers. You know, like you see at Home Depot, right? They're in the container. There was like 12 or 13 of them just piled up, piled up. And I said to my, I said to my dad, I said, Dad, where's my container? He said, over there. So I went over lifted up the container. Sure enough, in there was my, everything I just told you all about, my mom collected, and my life in one container, I thought. So as I opened it up, looked, and I said, okay, to my daughter, we're gonna sit and visit granddaddy a little bit. And, uh, and as I turned, my father said, oh, no, 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 no. There's like five of those containers, six of them belong to you. Now, I gotta say this. When I was going through high school, well, College, and when I came home, because I played, I was a student athlete in college, I played basketball, I traveled for pretty much of my, my young adult life and played overseas. I would come home on those days that we had vacations, breaks, and I had layovers, and I'd walk into my home, my parents' home, and my room was converted into kind of like a storage area, but it wasn't a hoarder's area, it was storage, and it had catalog. So I said to my mom, I said, why, it, why can't I go in my bedroom? Why can't I just, go in there and lay down, and I don't have a bed there, the dresser drawers are out, well, go down the hall and go to your brother's bedroom, and you can stay in there, nobody's here, nobody about it. So I got really fury, infuriated with that, so I turned around and I walked down into the den, I looked at my dad, but I looked at my mom, and I said to her, you remind me of Fred Sanford. <laughs> now, some of us know who Fred Sanford was, he was an African-American junk dealer from Watts, Los Angeles, back in the 70s, it was a sitcom, and he had a son that was with him. So. My mother didn't take too kind to that being called a junk deal because Fred Sanford thought everything was of value. I have to keep everything. We're going to get money on this and we're going to have history on it. And my dad was laughing, right? So I turned to him and I said, you're no better. You're Lamont. You're the son. <laughs> so after that exchange, I go through all the things, kind of surface look at them, put them in my car, and now I decide to take this stuff home, but I had to make three trips because I live in Brantford, Connecticut, right? And took them home, finally, in two days trip it took me, put them in my basement, and then I decided to start taking things out. My daughter was with me, and I took everything out, because I used to call her stuff junk. So what I did was took everything out, looked, and the next thing I knew, I'm saying to myself, hmm, I gotta do something with this, Victoria, she's with me. And she said, Daddy, Mama's, my, my wife's not going to let us keep this stuff in this basement. And I said, well, what should we do? She said, you know what you got to do. So I picked up my phone, and I started cruising through my phone looking for 1-800-JUNK. And as I looked through that phone and I found the number 1-800-JUNK, as I'm getting ready to dial, all of a sudden I got this excruciating pain in my neck. It was like something I've never felt. It was like hurtful. And I went like this, and I dropped the phone. My daughter said, Daddy. That's Grammy telling you, you better not touch her junk and throw it away. <laughs> so at that point, I said, maybe you're right. 
So we revisited a week, a week later, and as I'm transitioning off the police department and trying to figure out what am I gonna do next in life because I'm gonna have a lot of time on my hands. And plus I had been collecting a little bit on the side, but nobody ever knew it. So I, I, it came to, it was an epiphany. I had to tell my mother's story using her artifacts. And it just came as plain as day. Like, this is what you're gonna do. She used to call me boy, right? She said, boy, this is what you're gonna do. You're going to tell my story. You're gonna tell the story, not only mine, but hundreds of thousands of other African Americans who made their way across this country, and maybe even further before that. So that's what I started doing. And before I knew it, I was bitten by the bug that my mom and my dad. Now, my mom was the driving factor of this whole thing. How am I doing, Pastor? All right. Okay. <laughs> Told them, get a hook and pull me off. So I started to take this stuff on the road. Just for anybody to hear, churches, civil, civic organizations, schools, and so forth. But I've been coming in out of Stratford for so many years, several years. They were kind. I was like, what gives? These white folks are kind. Why do they want to see this stuff? I heard so much about Stratford and being a law enforcement officer. I heard 30, 40 years ago, the Grand Club, uh, Imperial Wizard from Shelton used to walk through town like they used to have rallies like it was nobody's business. But I said, this town was very generous. I sat with the mayor, Mayor Laura Hordick. Um, I should say, I was, I was not invited by most of my urban communities. Hartford, New Haven that I protected and served, Waterbury, Bridgeport. Who would ever thunk I'd be here in Stratford? So now we got a 501c3. I'm talking to Laura Hoydick and her administration. Next thing I know, she's working on trying to figure out where we can go. So I'm going home every night, scratching my head, calling my mom, I'm calling my friends and talking to my wife. What gives? Why is this community so hell-bent on wanting me to be? They weren't hell-bent, but they were cooperating with me. And it just came out to the fact that they were genuine, open people who wanted to see something other than what they have been seeing and to educate, not just black folks, white folks, Asian, Latino, and so forth. And so here we are in this community. There's so much more I can tell you, but we're, if you come to the museum, you'll hear the other part of this, right? And I promise I won't be as long-winded and the horns won't go off. That's on my domain, Mom. She was a very spiritual woman, my mom, and, uh, and I, 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 I credit her and my dad, um, and now my, my late sister of two years ago who's with them. Um, I'm blessed, thoroughly blessed. This community has opened their arms, accepted what this is, and I will not let anybody, and I'm going to be done in a second, I will not let anyone come into that museum feeling as though they're going to have their fingers, people are going to point fingers at them. None of you all had nothing to do with what you're going to see in this museum when you come. And I make that clear, I make that clear. Very understandable. Um, both sides had a part in this history, this horrible, dark history. And it starts back in Africa, starts during the pyramids, and I make no excuses for what you're going to see. I definitely don't make excuses. This museum is very transparent, and, and, and it's an educational opportunity for everyone. I'm still learning. And one thing I'm going to tell you and tell people, I am not an anthropologist. I am not a historic te history teacher. Although people want to make me that, I am no more than somebody who is trying to tell a story and I collect and I want this to be an enriched museum for everybody to enjoy. So having said all that, um, I, I just want to thank you all. And, and again, I did pretty good considering the horns and, and being so much long-winded. And I, I, I enjoy um, taking you all on a visit. We'll get you all through. If all of you all want to get through there, come there, and we'll be there. And I see a, my good friend Amanda here from... No, no, that's not Amanda. It looks like Amanda. See, I don't have my glasses. <laughs> you look like Amanda. Excuse me. But anyhow, thank you for uh, listening to me and inviting me into your church here. And uh, you're welcome. Um, to so come to my place anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
join me in the common commission let us go forth into the world in peace being of good courage holding fast to that which is good rendering to no one evil for evil strengthening the faint-hearted supporting the weak helping the afflicted honoring all people loving and serving the Lord and rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit Okay, I hope he's given you a taste. That these aren't little things in this place. There's a lot of very big things as well. I hope you'll come over uh, as we you know, greet folks and briefly have some refreshments and then we'll head over. Would you bow your heads for the benediction? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with each and every one of you. Amen.
I have to 